You are Locked On Dodgers Postcast. Part of Locked On Los Angeles on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome in once again to the Dodger Postcast on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel, the place to hang out when every game is done, and on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. I am Pete Fox, covering sports in LA for ESPN LA and NBC Sports Radio, dating back to 2007. Tonight's show brought to you by eBay Motors, from brakes to exhaust kits and beyond. eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive with all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to bring home that big win. Keep your ride or die alive. eBayMotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay. Guaranteed fit for only. uh, um, Guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Well, uh, I'll tell you what was not a good fit tonight for the Dodgers. Their pitching staff and the Padres hitters. 14 walks. I mean, come on. And there's a lot of other things that went on in this game, but that's all. That's the only thing I can really focus on as to why this game went south. Let's get Jeff's feeling. Uh, joining me now from Locked On Dodgers, our friend Jeff Snyder, who is uh, probably a little up in arms. Maybe I don't know. I'm I'm feeling like this was a a frustrating series, a frustrating game, and uh, there was a lot of fun things that happened. Home runs are good. Fans in the outfield switching balls out of their pocket. That was fun. But the rest, it's all overshadowed by 14 walks. I, I mean, I got somebody here in the comments that are like, fire Dave Roberts. I mean, look, let's let's save that for the postseason. And that's the mantra of the postseason. We're not firing that's, that's, Dave that's Roberts. That's the mantra of every, you know, 80% of Dodger fans, 365 days a year. But you know, I don't I don't get up in arms in April. But if I did, 14 walks would do it. That was I mean, the Dodgers didn't deserve to win that game. It was crazy that they were in it for as long as they were. Uh, James Paxton was flirting with disaster the whole game, and uh, he never ran into the full disaster. Uh, but you know, when when the Dodgers have at least one, maybe two bullpen games coming up later this week, uh, they kind of needed Paxton to stay in the game, and then they. You know, they use their good relievers on Saturday. And so it was, you know, Ryan Brazier, I think, is eventually going to be okay. But so far, you know, he'd be a little bit questionable. And J.P. Fireisen, first game, uh, well, I I think he pitched once in Korea. But uh, really coming off a year and a half off, like, you know, it's, yeah, there's no excuse for 14 walks. And you're not going to win many games that way. Uh, I guess if there's one bright spot, it's easy to, we can assume they're not going to walk 14 guys tomorrow. And so... Uh, we can assume that tomorrow will be better. Yeah. uh, There's a lot of people that agree with fire Dave Roberts. Dave Dave Roberts is a cheerleader, not a manager. Uh, You know, he gets outmanaged all the time. Look, I don't see, I I feel like at times on this subject, and we're not going to get deep into it because this is going to go on for the rest of the season. But I feel like at times he is too tied to the guys in the basement and the analytics and all of that. But that rears its ugly head more in the postseason than it does this time of year. And you're right. Maybe I am too upset about a loss to the Padres in April. But it is the Padres, and they look damn good today. And I don't like that at all. And the fact that that they only scored six runs when they got 14 walks. Like, I mean, the the Padres, you know, fire Mike Schilt. That's what I'm saying. No, (laughs) I, I, uh, yeah, I, I think most of Dave Roberts' failures in the postseason have come when he didn't follow the stats enough. Uh, and I think that uh, Dave Roberts probably did not give the walk 14 guys sign today. Uh, <laughs> at some point, you have to blame the the, the players for failing to perform. Yeah, and when exactly. you walk 14 guys, that's on the pitchers, not the manager. Right. I mean, uh, you were right about Paxton. At times, it felt like he was going to have another one of those outings. Craig's is a regular here. Uh, last time Paxton pitch, he kind of did that thing where it was bend, not break. And it seemed to work out for him. His numbers weren't great, but he ended up, uh, I, I'm, I think he got the win and he went five. He looked pretty decent at times. He got himself out of jams on a regular basis. I thought it was going to be another one of those performances. Uh, you know, first inning got the first two outs and then a walk. Uh, and, and then, you know, no harm, no foul in the first inning. And then before you know it, every 3-1 pitch turned into a walk for him, and he finished with eight walks on the night. And, uh, yeah, it probably should have been a whole lot worse than it was. And the fact that the Dodgers were uh, 
up 3-1, and then it was tied for a while. Uh, it was pretty surprising, I guess you would say, uh, the fact that they were able to at least uh, – you know, keep this game interesting into the late innings of the game, I think is a minor miracle with 14 walks. That's one of those stats. They kept throwing out all this uh, comparative stats from 1924 was the last time. 1962 it hasn't happened in 30 years or whatever. Yeah. They mostly just talked about shoes, but occasionally they comment on the game. <laughs> Uh, I think I think Craig's remembering his first start of the season. Last time he was actually really good. Six innings and only allowed four base runners. It was his first start of the season when he went five innings, four hits, and five walks, and but somehow no runs. And that's kind of what we thought we were getting this time. I mean, he he was he, he got through five innings with only one run allowed, just the Machado home run. Like the the first six walks didn't hurt him, right? Uh, but then the last two knocked him out of the game, and then uh, you know, eventually both of those guys scored. Uh, so his end line, yeah, two of his eight walks did score. Uh, but you know, if I think most of the, if this game, not, not that any game matters less, I know they all count the same, but if it wasn't April 14th with two bullpen games coming up this, this week, James Paxson wouldn't have been out there for the sixth inning. He would have pitched five innings, allowed one run, and gotten away with it with his six walks. Uh, and but you know the the bullpen had to pitch too. And right now with with Trinan and Gratter all both out, you know mm -hmm. it, it's the the bullpen is very top heavy and not getting necessarily the contributions from the bottom half of the bullpen that you might hope. And you know it's uh, it, it's it's usually not going to manifest itself in fourteen walks, but it is, uh, it happened. Yeah. I think, uh, for me personally, when it comes to this Dodger offense, when you hear all the stats coming into the game, like their, you know, their OPS is nearly a thousand to the top of the lineup and just how effective Mookie Betts is that, you know, leading this, the league in hits and walks, he's had more home runs than swings and misses things like that. And, and, you know, just the name Shohei Otani and what he's been doing over these last 10 games. I know he didn't have a hit last night, but another one tonight and it struck out a couple of times. Didn't look great. But I think overall, when you put this team together, we think they're going to win every game. And when they don't and when they fall behind and don't come back for me, it becomes a little frustrating. I'm trying to check myself to say, hey, they're not going to win them all. I've said it on the po postcast plenty of times. They're not going to win them all. Uh, it, it, there are going to be issues. This is still a baseball team and everyone that they play against are professionals and they, especially the Padres, right? They want to beat the Dodgers really, really badly. This game went, meant way more to them than it did to the Dodgers. Uh, this series meant more to them. And you could see that they were excited about winning this series. And I say, congratulations. They, they, they did well. They hit the ball in clutch situations and got on base and scored runs and hit home runs and, uh, you know, kept grinding. That's, that's the mantra of this series. Really the Padres kept grinding and the Dodgers really didn't. So I, hopefully they learn from this and move on and say, all right, next time out <laughs> against the Padres, we're going to grind a little bit more. All right, Jeff, you want to stay for one more segment? Cause there's more stuff that's way more important than ERAs and walks and, you know, on base percentage that we need to talk about. All right. Absolutely. All right, we'll uh, hit the first break. Uh, he is Jeff Snyder from Locked On Dodgers. Uh, he and Vince will be at it again tomorrow morning for you, so be sure to check them out there on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel, and you can listen on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. We'll hit the first break and come back. All right, tonight's show brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience are what brings the winning trophy home and it's what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to, level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, brake kits. Jeff, have you ever put any brakes on from eBay Motors? I know I have. And Not I'm brakes, other things though exhaust kits and roof racks and things like that <laughs> yeah i know i when i the first time i did breaks that i got from ebay and I, i'm not even kidding i i i couldn't believe how reasonable they were and i couldn't believe that i was able to do it it's really not that hard so uh give it a shot watch some youtube videos and it'll pay off in the long run if, especially if you buy the parts at ebay motors they have 122 million parts for your ride or die and you'll always find exactly what you're looking for with ebay's guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need 
at the prices you want. It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, this is the uh, Dodger Postcast on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel, the place to hang out when every game is done. And you can listen to us on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. I am Pete Fox. He is Jeff Schneider. Uh, So the deal with the guy, well, let's back up one step on home run balls. Uh, Last time we talked about a week ago, the whole Shohei Otani first home run ball was a controversy. The lady that caught the ball didn't feel she was treated appropriately. And I guess to the Dodgers' credit, they backpedaled. Uh, I saw a bunch of pictures on Instagram yesterday where they brought them in with Otani. Like you had mentioned that you would want a picture. They got that picture. They got multiple pictures. They got a signed bat. I think all in all, they're happy. It seems like the the PR flub hanging over this thing has kind of been rectified. Were you happy with how that all turned out? Yeah, I'm glad they did something. I think that it was mostly probably buyer's remorse. Uh, I think they, they were, you know, maybe they weren't thrilled with how this thing went down, but they were, I think they were happy enough with the stuff they got on the night of. And then when they read the lies that the ball was worth a hundred thousand dollars, they got a little buyer's remorse. And so I'm glad they did something more, but you know, hopefully everybody's happy because the whole point of uh, all of us loving the Dodgers is, is loving the same thing and not being mad at each other. Yeah, so today Machado hits a home run into the stands, into the left field pavilion, and the guy who caught the ball uh, had another ball in his pocket and pulled it out, and the the cameras caught it right away, and then they sent Buster out there, Buster uh, Buster Olney, and he interviewed the guy, and at first I was kind of like, I don't know, that's that's a bit cheap, right? You either have the huevos to throw it back or you don't, right? own up to it but i did feel like when buster interviewed him he was couldn't have been more honest and more real and owned up to it and this is the kind of thing where he could have danced around and tap danced and and been a real a-hole and it could have been very uncomfortable for a second i thought and ultimately it turned out to be a nice little fun story and we move on and it's no big deal because he just owned it and i think when we come away from that story we're like why would your wife get mad at you for bringing home a baseball it's not like you're bringing home a dog or a car it's a ball doesn't take up a lot of space yeah i was mostly at this point we didn't find out what kind of shoes he was wearing but beyond that you know i I think uh throwing the ball back on an opposing player home run is a wrigley field thing and other stadiums, I just let their fans keep the balls they catch. And so I I, I, I love his approach of being ready. He yeah. brought his glove like you're supposed to, like yeah. you and I talked about last time. Bring your glove if you're sitting in, in the bleachers. And he caught the ball on the fly, and he was ready. He had the ball in his right pocket because he's right-handed. He, he was ready for the moment, and the moment found him. And I think he handled it perfectly. And uh, I have nothing but respect for that guy. Uh, I, I think his huevos are exactly the right size. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, he handled it well. I mean, he could have been a little bit smoother as he's throwing the ball. You like you said, see- nobody, in the, nobody in the, in the bleachers caught him. Yeah, that's true. It, it was uh, only because the TV cameras happened to catch it. That's the only yeah. reason he got found out. Yeah. You could see it in his glove. I mean, maybe the, the, uh, exchange could be a little bit smoother, you know, like a double play turn there, but I think he did a good job. You're right to, to be that, uh, ready is the biggest thing like oh it's coming here it is oh here we go i gotta get this other ball out and he did it fairly smoothly and then when they interviewed him about it he just owned right up to it yep 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 nobody <laughs> i didn't want to get booed so here's what i did and, and but that that you know when you and i talked last week that's what i said when if the ball leaves the site of the authenticator they can't authenticate the ball and that shows why because you never right. know what these people if that if he picks that up off the ground and you know puts it in his glove and reaches it in his pocket and stands up and holds up that one Yep. You know, you think he's going to sell that ball for a hundred thousand bucks, no matter how important it is. No, because nobody can authenticate it. Right. And then, uh, later in the game, Schilt got upset because of the whole Otani, uh, commemorative ball or so they kept switching the balls out. Cause what he's tied with, um, Matsui yeah. for the all time Japanese home run lead. And I, the next one will make him the all time Japanese home run lead in major league baseball. So they kept switching baseballs in and out. And I don't know I why thought- it was, why was yeah, it? I it was weird that he got upset then because this what? was what Otani's eighth at bat that they were switching out balls because they've been doing it the last two games since he tied yeah. Matsui. And so I don't understand. Like, so I I was assuming that's what it was about, but I I 
I can't think of anything else they would have been talking about, but it was mm -hmm. a weird time to be upset about that. Yeah, maybe he wasn't paying attention before that. Uh, so who knows? But he says uh, a lot of great things about him. The uh, <laughs> well, he's they they had you know they they seem to be playing well, and they've seemed that or they've said rather that this is a lot based on Schilt's managerial style. Uh, you know, better than what was going on last year. Cause just two years ago, that team was really good. And then they fell apart last year, a lot of infighting. So a lot of times it's hard to get a team back on track when there's a bunch of infighting going on. And apparently he has done that. I mean, these are the two highest scoring teams in the league. So they're definitely doing something right down there. And uh, coming into Dodger Stadium to take two of three is, uh, you know, is nothing that you should laugh at. I feel like it was a nice win for them. And the Dodgers should really kind of open their eyes and go, this team is going to come back and try this again. And uh, they're going to want to beat us. And we need to uh, be more awake and I don't know, serious or not issue 14 walks and uh, you know, have more clutch hits. And it was just, I didn't feel like this game once they went down six, three. And I've said before that one of the things I like about this Dodger team right now is that their ability to hold a run one lead is very good and when they're down a run or two, it seems like they rally almost all the time. But when they went down 6-3 tonight, it felt like the end of a six-game road trip and they were on their way home. Like, there was just no fight in the dog tonight. I don't know what that was about. Yeah, I I, I don't generally uh, – I, I probably don't agree with you on that. I think that's usually uh, we're looking at the results and trying to ascribe motivations or whatever to it. I think the fact is sometimes – the other teams win and sometimes the other team's pitchers get you out. And I think every guy came up there wanting to do his part to have a comeback. And it just doesn't happen because like you said, the Padres are a solid team. Their bullpen's pretty good. And so I think it's easy to look at it and say, Oh, they didn't want it enough when really, I mean, if, if all it took was desire, then yeah. they'd go 162 and zero every year. Yeah. And, it, and on the, if someday we ran into a game between two teams with the exact same amount of desire, the game would never end and the world would explode. And luckily that's not the case. You know, desire is important, but I think in order to get to the big leagues, you've kind of, you, 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 for the most part, you usually nailed the desire part, the competitiveness part. This was a fact of they played worse than the Padres tonight and they, and they scored fewer runs. As for the other thing, uh, the Padres are now nine and nine, right? Or uh, I think they're nine and nine. Yeah, yeah they are. Uh, so that's 500. Last year they finished 82 and 80. Uh, so I'm going to need a little bit. I, I'm going to need them to at least get above 500 before I'm ready to put Mike Schilt in the hall of fame. I'm also <laughs> not sure which managerial narrative to buy because the giants are supposed to be good because they have Bob Melvin now, but the Padres are supposed to be, be, be good because they don't have Bob Melvin anymore. And the Dodgers are going to, uh, lose all their games because fire Dave Roberts. And I, I'm just, I, I think everybody puts way more, uh, credit and blame, on the managers when the fact is the players play the game and managers can only do so much. Well, you know, maybe Bob Melvin felt that he was going to get fired because he could see the writing on the wall and he bailed before that happened. So uh, it, I did feel like when, because I was working in San Diego when that Padre team started to turn around uh, and Bob Melvin was a big part of that. And it was just surprising how fast it went South. Now you're right. I don't know uh, what's up with Schilt, right? He, he, seems like a capable manager, but he also didn't get fired in St. Louis or something. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just the fact of baseball, but ultimately you're right. Uh, I, I, I part of my uh, perception on baseball right now is, is severely tied to basketball when it comes to effort. Cause you know, I'm covering the Clippers getting ready for the playoffs and that is a defensive or a uh, effort minded game especially when it comes to defense and the clippers have been struggling with that so i i feel like you're right i'm taking that perception and i'm now uh tying it to baseball saying you need to try harder you need to want it more you need to have more effort and it, it, it's probably not an appropriate way to look at it especially in april but uh when we come back from the break jeff uh this this profar thing from yesterday was hanging over uh the postcast last night i for whatever reason missed it but I went back and watched it today, and I want to get your take on that. Dodgers lose tonight 6-3. Uh, they were up 3-1, and the Padres battled back to tie it. And then a home run uh, or a three walks and uh, just an awful sixth inning with uh, 
from the Dodger bullpen uh, gave the Padres a 6-3 advantage, which they held on to. Uh, we'll hit the final break and come back and wrap this up. It's Dodger Postcast on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel and the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. All right, we have a couple of sponsors to talk about here. Wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investments and retirement accounts in one place with Yahoo Finance, uh, who are a sponsor of the show tonight. You can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. Uh, when I first started investing uh, on a very low level, like in college and stuff, uh, Yahoo Finance is what I stumbled into, ironically, and I used it quite frequently to look up uh, ticker prices. And it, it is 100% true, not just saying that the way they consolidate your 401k and the tickers and all of the uh, stocks that you own is very user friendly. Uh, let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to the deal to deal with the rising cost of inflation to pay off your debt, your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of your financial freedom. With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to news, data, and buying stocks. Uh, when it comes to buying stocks, you need data and tools to buy the right ones, no one to hold on to them, no one to sell. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it right, you've saved, you've researched, you've invested all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using every financial great uh what is hold on every financial great uses that makes no sense uh yahoo finance for more than 25 years yahoo finance has been the brand behind every great investor security secure securely link your brokerage accounts uh, for a unified view of your wealth including 401k and other investments a comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors and how yahoo finance ensures that you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For a comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. Also want to uh, tell you that tonight's show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's Monopoly like you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Charge other players rent for your iconic properties and a whole lot more. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there. Put on your game face and download Monopoly Go now for free at the App Store. A lot of sponsors, Jeff. A lot of sponsors. I guess that's a good thing, right? Uh, tonight's uh, postcast is, of course, available to you on Locked On Dodgers podcast feed, wherever you find your podcast. And, of course, you can watch us on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel, the place to hang out when every game is done. He's Jeff Schneider from Locked On Dodgers. I am Pete Fox, host of the Locked On Dodgers postcast. We come on right after the game and break it down, which we're doing tonight. 14 walks is the uh, story of tonight's game as the Dodgers lose 6-3. But last night, Jerickson Profar took an inside pitch and didn't like it and then got into a little... Uh, uh, I don't want to call it a shouting match. They were kind of bickering at each other, he and Will Smith. And a lot of the uh, regulars here were commenting that he was an a-hole and a douche and this and that and the other thing. I did think it was a little sensitive. It wasn't that high and tight. It wasn't chin music. It was kind of up and in. It wasn't worthy of what Profar did, I don't think. What was your thought? Also, Gavin Stone was throwing a perfect game. He's not going to throw it a batter. Well, he's throwing a perfect game because if you hit a batter, he gets to go first base and then you're not throwing a perfect game anymore. And if you're mad at him for squaring around to bunt, trying to break up your perfect game, uh, Gavin Stone went to college. He's too smart. He's a college boy, too smart to say to punish him for trying to break up my perfect game. I'm going to break up my perfect game. So uh, and I think Jerickson Profar is smart enough to know that, too. I think Jerickson's Profar likes to stir the pot. He has a history of stirring the pot with the Dodgers. And you know what? They're, they're trying to make it a rivalry. I get it. Uh, I think he was much more effective uh, at stirring the pot 
with his three run double to win the game tonight. I think he should try that approach more often instead of being a crybaby about something dumb. Uh, but you know what? Here we are talking about for the second straight night. So he was probably at least somewhat effective. Uh, you know, Will Smith called him irrelevant after the game. I'm sure there's plenty of social media takes. How relevant is he now? Uh, well, you know what? Just because he hit a double doesn't mean that it wasn't stupid last night. Uh, I like Dave Roberts' take more. He said uh, he didn't even say Profar's name, but he said it was uh, the, it was a lack of feel, which is basically Dave Roberts speak for saying he doesn't understand baseball. Uh, I think lack of feel is about the strongest insult you can give that one ball player can give another one. You just don't get the game. You know, it's kind of the if you played, you'd get it. You know, um, and so I like that more. I think. I, I said on Twitter, I think Smith's was better trash talk. Uh, I think Roberts was a better insult. Um, but yeah, it, it was dumb. Uh, but I do assume that Profar knew it was dumb at the time. He didn't actually think Stone was throwing at him. He just saw, hey, here's an opportunity to to glare at him and, and try to get things riled up. Yeah, and he did. And I think that's cool. I'm okay with that. You know, this time of year, uh, these games are, are fun uh, because there is a rivalry. I don't know how big it is, but it is a rivalry. For whatever reason, you know, having gone to school in San Diego and worked down there a lot of a, a lot of times, uh, different parts of my career, I started my radio career down there. People in San Diego hate L.A. I don't oh, it's know. It's definitely why. everywhere in San Diego for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the people in L.A. are like, whatever. We like to visit San Diego. It's a pretty city. America's finest city, as a matter of fact. That's what you guys say. We enjoy it. It's pretty. Love going to the beach. Uh, so. I don't know why you hate us, but whatever, you know, Dodgers don't care or LA doesn't care about the fact that uh, San Diego hates them. So, and I've never lived in LA or San Diego. I just like the Dodgers, you know? Yeah. How did that happen by the way? Well, I mean, I'm from Lake Elsinore. So oh, okay. my, and my dad's from LA and he was four years old when the Dodgers moved to town and they became a, a Dodger family once there was a team in town. And so by the time I was born 20 years later, we were a Dodgers family. Uh, very nice. So that's cool. Uh, back to the bullpen real quick is, you know, we've got a lot of comments here that, you know, the bullpen is the biggest issue with the Dodgers right now. And I, and I don't necessarily disagree, but as you pointed out, there's a handful of guys that are still injured. That'll be returning. And that means some other guys that are there now uh, are, are going to be out, whether it's sent down released. I don't, you know, IL, they're going to have to find a place for some of these guys. Who do you think is going to be top of that list? Is it uh, Vessia, Fireheisen, uh, Brazier? I feel like Brazier's been okay, so I don't know that he would be on that list for me. But Vessia potentially, although he pitched well tonight, uh, I don't know who, who do you who, who's kind of a top of that list, if you will, a front runner for somebody who might lose their spot when uh, some of these other guys that are on the IL come back. I think Brazier, between his veteran status and his contract status, he's going to get plenty of opportunities to to find last year's form. He he's been solid this year. Uh, you know, up until the three run homer yesterday, he he's been really good so far this season. Um, you know, when you look at like Fire Eisen is going to be one of those guys. He, he's going to be back in the minors uh, very soon. He's mm -hmm. going to go back and forth. He's going to be a kind of guy at least for now, that they call up when they need somebody uh, and then send them back down. But Fire Eisen has a history of being successful in the big leagues. Like he pitched before he got hurt. He had a zero ERA in, you know, a, an actual real number of innings. Uh, I think it's like 22 innings for the uh, the Rays in 2020, whatever year, 22. Um, and, and so like, because he didn't get hurt till June. I think his last game was June 2nd of that year. And, and he hadn't allowed a run yet. And so obviously that's not the case with this year's Dodgers. Uh, he was, uh, yeah, he hasn't been great. Uh, but, you know, he's he's going to be back in the minors soon. They have, I, I think, Nabil Krizma and uh, Denelson Lamette both cleared waivers, both back with, uh, with AAA now. And so they'd both have to be added to the 40-man roster again to get called up. So, But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see one or both of them get the call up and then DFA uh, you know, when they're done with them treatment at another time or two this season. Uh, Vesia is kind of the big question mark because he hasn't been nearly as dominant the last year or two uh, as he was early in his Dodgers career. And, and that's, uh, he's not a guy who you really trust in any situation right now. Um, yeah. And once, you know, if Brazier gets back to form, 
and Trinan and Gratter all come back. Then they have all three of those guys actually have a little bit reverse splits. They're both all three dominant against left-handed batters. So you don't necessarily need a left-handed guy in the bullpen, especially with the three batter minimum. You know, like you don't necessarily need a lefty in the bullpen. You need a, guys who can get both sides out. And when the Dodgers bullpen is all healthy, they have that. Uh, I think Cal Hurt, because his uh, uh, repertoire, he'll be a similar kind of guy. Uh, so, you know, Kyle Hurt will be back up at some point, probably this week to take down part of one of those bullpen games. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, I think bullpen help is going to be on their radar all radar all season come the trade deadline and everything, because the bullpen is always a question, right? Because relievers are the most volatile people in sports. You can be a great reliever one year and be lousy the next year. That doesn't happen with point guards or quarterbacks or, uh, any other baseball position, it only happens with relief pitchers. And uh, and it's not just the Dodgers, it's every team. Yeah, Chris Matt pitched well right before they sent him down. I was I was sorry to see that happen. And Denelson Lamette has been good too, and he's been sent down. So that's good to have them kind of in the you know, waiting in the wings, ready to come back up. And when Gratterall is healthy and trying in, yeah, it's it's gonna be a whole different thing. So let's not get too worried about it, too upset about it just yet. Oh, one more controversy that came up during this game if you will and i've been hearing a lot about this that the pitch clock is causing pitchers to get injured to me this seems preposterous uh i i don't under like what would an extra 15 20 seconds do to a pitcher's arm in the middle of an outing that would keep them healthier than the pitch clock status right I, yeah I, I, I think the pitch clock may be playing a part but only exacerbating the actual causes. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear the main cause. I don't think there's any one cause, but the fact is there's not more pitchers getting hurt right now. It's just that it happens to be a few big names right now. And so just like when Buster Posey got, you know, his leg broken in a home plate collision, they're like, oh, well, maybe we ought to do something about home plate collisions, you know, and it went, when a big start, it, it becomes a talking point. And, you know, I feel bad for, uh, all the catchers whose careers ended with from home plate collisions, but they weren't big enough names. So major league baseball never changed that rule for them, you know? And, and so now it's to say, Oh, Spencer Strider's hurt. We must do something now. And yeah. you know, it's, it's like, it, it's not more than anything else. But the fact is what do all these guys have in common? They throw crazy hard, harder than the human body is meant to throw. And so, yeah, the pitch clock could like maybe in order to throw hundred percent effort, every pitch you do need, 25 seconds between pitches to to gear up to wind your clock back up so you can throw 100 again so maybe 18 seconds isn't enough to do that 15 seconds and you know but the fact is the solution to that isn't get rid of the pitch clock it's stop throwing max effort every pitch you know what how about get a ground out once in a while instead of trying to strike out 27 batters a game yeah i i, I mean obviously there's probably a lot of different things people got hurt throwing out their arm before the pitch clock was around. So <laughs> they are now, as Tyler Glass now said during the game, there's a lot of things that play into it, like you just said. Uh, it, it's probably a little bit of all of these things, but the, you can't put your finger on one thing. But the main thing is that pitchers are throwing harder. They're trying to throw with more velocity, and that's a new part of the game. Let's not forget when this game started, overhand throwing was illegal right? Yeah. They, you can't throw it. You have to throw it underhand. And then they started the whole sidearm thing. And then at some point they just said, all right, just throw it however you want to throw it. But it's not the, there's a reason that on a softball team, they have like two pitchers because you can throw that motion all day long for nine innings or however long softball games go. And it doesn't hurt your arm. Throwing overhand is going to hurt your arm, especially when you're throwing it at a hundred or high 90 mile an hour velocity right so it's yeah. something that's been around for years to say that it's because of the pitch clock to me just seems ridiculous i i you know it, yeah it's like you know tommy john surgery is called tommy john surgery because tommy john had the surgery before i was born i've got gray hair pete and <laughs> like so don't tell me that this rule that's been around for 13 months is the cause of all these people having this surgery that's been around for 50 years you know yeah. And, yeah, and the fact I mentioned this on Locked On Dodgers last week, we were talking about this. Nolan Ryan uh, is one of the hardest throwers in baseball history. Some say he may have thrown as high as hard as 108 miles an hour, but he didn't do it every pitch. And the way you could tell he didn't do it every pitch is because if you threw every pitch 108 miles an hour, you would never lose a game, especially when you had his curveball too. 
Like if you could throw 108 every pitch, you'd be the best pitcher in baseball history. Uh, and, and you, you know, and so the fact is that's how we know Nolan Ryan didn't go max effort every pitch because he actually lost a fair amount of games. And it's, that's why he was able to pitch for 27 years yeah. and occasionally throw a hundred and something miles an hour. But I bet Nolan Ryan's average fastball was 93 miles an hour. And he would sometimes say, all right, I, I'm, I'm going for it on this one. Say, I, the, I threw that one 101, you know, but uh, that's how you pitch for a long time and stay healthy is by picking your spots and, and literally and figure pick your spots when to throw hard and hit your spots when you're pitching. And his legs were the size of tree trunks, and that's a big part of it. He did it with his lower body, not his. And yeah, he's a freaking nature too. He's an outlier. Yeah. You know, you look. We could talk about Sam McDowell, and you know, who Sam? Yeah, that's right. Sam McDowell was probably a better pitcher than Nolan Ryan, but he blew his arm out. You know, Sandy Koufax luckily had some elite seasons before he threw his arm out. But there's a huge long list. Frank Tanana. I grew up thinking Frank Tanana was a soft toss and lefty. Turns out he used to be a fireballer before he threw his arm out. You know, yeah. it's like that this has been around as long as, like you said, as long as guys have been trying to throw hard, uh, arm injuries have and will continue to exist. Yeah, and Glasnow even mentioned that, among other things. BC points out that he mentioned the sticky stuff uh, causing them to have mechanical issues uh, or bad mechanics, rather, and that he is has been working, like you were pointing out, on, you know, finding better opportunities, not always throwing full out, you know, just being a better pitcher and not a thrower. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Fred Robin has done a lot of really bad things. Uh, the worst thing he ever did was changing the sticky stuff rule in the middle of the season with no warning. Like Glasnow said, if you're yeah. changing something that drastically, that's something you announce at the very beginning of the off season. So the pitchers have four months to get ready for it. Because the fact is, you know, they, the, it was a drastic change and it did cause injuries, uh, but that was a few years ago. Uh, and, and so pitchers have adjusted to that now. And now it's, you know, there's always going to be something pitching. Jacob deGrom is proof. The human body isn't supposed to throw that hard. And, you know, and now Spencer Strider's proof too, and so many other guys. Yeah, no, it's interesting for sure. Uh, I remember another uh, history of baseball stat that was uh, kind of mind boggling when the spitball was legal, like in the twenties. Uh, and they finally outlawed it. Uh, they said it's outlawed for only new pitchers, new yeah. people to the league. If you are grandfathered in, you can keep throwing it until your career ends. The so, last pitcher to legally throw a spitball was former Dodger Burley Grimes. Yeah, exactly. He lasted like 10 or 12 years after they outlawed it. And so he was able to keep throwing it. All right. Well, uh, good stuff, Jeff, as always. Uh, always interesting. Dodgers off. No, no, they play tomorrow against Washington, not off. Uh, they kick off a series tomorrow at the Ravine. This is uh, the second uh, series of this nine-game homestand. So they uh, fall 6-3 tonight to the Padres, losing the series two games to one. Uh, as far as the loss, I believe that uh, the Big Maple suffered the loss because he walked like 27 guys. I don't know no, exactly. I don't think he would have got the loss because he only allowed three runs. And oh, that's so, right. He left with no decision. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it would be fire eisen, right? Fire mm -hmm. eisen. Yes, indeed. You're right. So, but let's be honest. Paxton deserves the loss with that. Uh, many you know what? Fire eisen's ERA is 40.5. So I think he probably deserves a loss too. <laughs> so can you get that? Let's, let's change that rule. Two losses. You lose and you lose. <laughs> All right. Uh, he's uh, Jeff Snyder. Check out him and Vince on Locked On Dodgers. Uh, they'll probably do it here a little bit later, and it'll be up for you tonight into tomorrow morning, and uh, I'll be back with you tomorrow after the Dodgers take on the Nats. You can watch us on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel and listen on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. Jeff, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll talk to you very soon down the road. Have a good night, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Sounds good. Mm-hmm.